item 37, which is the uh, uh, code next uh, and ballot question. Um, Ms. Houston, do you want to make a motion? Uh, Mayor, I'd like to move my, um, my resolution. Ms. Houston moves uh, the resolution. Is there a second to that? Councilmember Alter seconds that. Ms. Houston, do you want to address it? Um, I, I'm going to address it just briefly, and then I'd like to hear it. I think we've got several speakers. I'll repeat again, it's item 37. Okay. Ms. Houston. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as we all know, on March the 29th, over 30,000 Austinites filed a petition demanding a public vote on Code Next. Uh, once a petition is verified, state law only gives the City Council two options. One is to adopt the petition sponsored ordinance or the second one is to order an, an election to let the voters decide. The council decided not to adopt the ordinance, and that's okay, but it is now the statutory obligation of the council to move this decision to the voters. I understand that attorneys differ um, on whether or not um, this is the right thing to do and whether or not the petition goes beyond the scope of a referendum, but that's not what we're here to decide today. It's my job as an elected member of this body to represent the will of the voters and not to bend the law in a way that would restrict the power of our residents to have their voices heard. And so since I'm not an attorney, this is a gray area to me. Uh, and so what I don't want the council to do is play judge and jury um, to this power of the referendum that's been reserved by the people. So my resolution, it will direct the city manager to develop language, all the appropriate language that's necessary to put this petition ordinance on the ballot. And so with that, I'd like to hear comments from the folks who signed up to speak. We'll go ahead and hear from them so that we can get the, the full breadth of the discussion. I'm going to move a substitute motion to this, as was posted on the bulletin board yesterday. Is there a second to the substitute? Councilmember Kitchen seconds that. Mayor. Uh, we ready to, I'll address it after the public speaks. So, so Mayor, just point of clarification, because yes. I don't have my Robert's Rules of Order here. Okay. If you vote against my uh, my my uh, <laughs> my resolution isn't that the same as you doing a substitute? No, because there are other resolve clauses. I'm not. I don't want to 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 just vote against yours uh, because I think there's other action that we can be taking as a council. So that would be an insufficient remedy or or, or statement for me. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Certainly. We've done it other. That's different ways, so I just yeah. need to be, in, be clear. Yeah, and, and when someone just comes in and says, I move a substitute to say no, then I say, then just vote no. Uh, but this substitute contains additional provisions. Okay? Mayor Pro Tem. I hope um, after the public discussion, we'll have an opportunity to talk about what those are. I'd like to better understand that too, because I, um, like Council Member Houston, felt like the remedy if you don't support the resolution would be just to vote against it. I also just wanted to ask you about the process you were going to use for the substitute motion. Are we going to do what we did uh, at, I think, our last meeting and make amendments to each before we determine which, um, which will be the motion on the floor? Yes, I think that's the only way to handle substitute motion. Okay, Unless thanks. we have otherwise agreement on the dais, we won't hear, so we're going to do it that way. Say that again. I, I'm sorry, that's I'm how, having trouble how, hearing you. That's how we're going to do it. Okay, so we will make amendments to each and then determine which one to vote on. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and call the uh, uh, folks that have signed up to uh, speak. Is uh, Ed English here? Is Bill Bunch here? Mr. Bunch will be on deck. Is Pat Broadnax here? Ah, I see you, thank you. So you'll have five minutes, Mr. Bunch. Mr. English, you can begin. <coughs> 
Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, my name is Ed English and I'm a long-term resident of North Austin. As I thought about what I might say today, I found myself resisting the temptation to offer comments that really are not to be considered regarding the vote you're about to take. This vote is not about how you or I feel about Code Next. This vote is not about how you or I feel about the spirit of 10-1. This vote is quite straightforward. This vote is about complying with the law and the right to vote. For those that vote for putting the petition on the ballot, I say thank you for doing what is right and required by law. For those that are considering voting against, I ask that you keep a few simple facts in mind. The city charter provides for a ballot initiative. State law provides for a ballot initiative. Almost 32,000 residents signed the petition. The petition was validated by the city clerk. Our petition has met every requirement to be placed on the ballot. Against that stands an attorney's opinion, an opinion that has no court ruling specific to this petition, either on its merits or to validate it. This council sits as a result of a ballot initiative that was not met with open arms by the at-large council setting at the time. In fact, the response was to place a competing option on the ballot. We were not met by the welcome wagon at the doors of the city clerk's office when we rolled in with our boxes of signed petitions. But to the credit of that council, they complied with the law and they put the 10-1 initiative on the ballot. For those that think the citizens of Boston should not have the right to vote on code next, I say comply with the law, put the petition on the, ba put the petition on the ballot, and then take your case to the public. You take your case to the public, I'll take my case to the public. Today is the day to stand with the city charter, to stand with state law, and to stand with 32,000 residents and simply do the right thing. Put the petition for the right to vote on code next on the ballot. Thank you. After Mr. Bunch, the next speaker will be Fred Lewis. Is Mary Ingle here? Okay. And is Mike uh, Hebert here? Okay. You'll have seven minutes, Mr. Lewis, after Mr. Bunch speaks. Mr. Bunch, you have five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for your service to our community. Um, with that said, I'm extremely disappointed to have to even be here today. Um, I think it's uh, really a travesty of, of justice and democracy that it's come to this. Um, some of you weren't here when the Save Our Springs initiative happened. Some of you were. And with that, you should remember that uh, the law in this situation is rather clear. Uh, it's not what your lawyer, Mr. Heath, spelled out in his memo. Uh, that's a sales pitch that ignores the issue that's in front of you today. Um, you can have all the policy differences in the world with the petition and think it's really a bad idea. You're welcome to that. Um, you might even think that a part of it is illegal, um, as your lawyer does. I think the facts that we agree to is that the vast majority of Code Next has nothing to do with zoning and is not prohibited in any way from the initiative process. That's Code Next. The ordinance itself that's been petitioned onto the ballot doesn't zone anything. It calls for a waiting period. It calls for voter ratification of whatever y'all might approve as a comprehensive rewrite to the land development code. Zoning is a tiny fraction of that. The petition ordinance has a severance clause. There is no way you can argue that that petition has been removed from the field of the initiative and referendum process. You're down to statutory construction. And that issue only comes up if and when it's passed uh, by the voters. The case your, your lawyer said in passing, Colson sets this out very clearly. The election may result in the disapproval of the proposed amendment. And therefore, under our Constitution, 
Uh, the courts cannot give advice nor decide cases upon speculative, hypothetical, or contingent situations. There's nothing that uh, disputes that today. Colson goes on to explain that the exercise of initiative and re referendum is the, the people of a power reserved to them and not the exercise of a right granted. And that in order to protect the people of the city in the exercise of this reserved legislative power, such charter provisions should be liberally construed in favor of the power reserved. The council's duty is clear and its compliance with the law is ministerial in nature. The council's refusal to submit the proposed amendments to the vote of the people thwarts not only the legislature's mandate, but the will of the public. You don't get to sit as the judge. You don't get to sit as the legislature. The people are doing that. You have a ministerial duty today. A case, the most recent Texas Supreme Court case, it's quoted right here, relying on the Colson case, which your, your uh, lawyer didn't bother to point to, from Houston, uh, uh, an initiative that people didn't like the policy. But that doesn't matter. You're standing in front of the public and their right to vote. You may not remo remember the rural council. Most people don't because they rendered their participation in the civic discourse largely meaningless for the one thing that they are remembered for. And that's the path that some of you are on. Some of you who are lawyers and should know better. What are you afraid of? The only thing we're asking for is the right to check your work. If you're going to pass a good code next, you should embrace having the voters check your work. We would love nothing more than to be out there beating the bushes and telling people to vote yes and approve a good code. We were working very hard towards that end until it became completely obvious that it was beyond repair. It's failed its fundamental two missions to simplify the current code. We started at 1,200 pages, we're now at 1,500. And to implement Imagine Austin, it doesn't do either one of those two things. You need to put this on the ballot and do the right thing. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Is Bobby Levinsky here? Is Bobby Levinsky here? You'll be on deck. Uh, is uh, Heidi Yohei here? Okay. Uh, Mr. Levinsky, you'll have five minutes. Mr. Lewis, you have seven minutes. Hopefully I won't take it. Uh, good afternoon, council and mayor. I've worked for 20 years to improve democracy in the state of Texas to remove big money from politics, to set up independent redistricting commissions. I drafted the 10-1 petition in the independent redistricting commission, and I helped draft the code next petition. I've dedicated the last 20 years of my life to democracy. So let's be real clear what this is about. This is not about code next. It's about whether or not you respect the democratic process. In 1912, with the power of home rule cities at the state level, cities got the power of initiative and referendum. It was part of the progressive movement that at least all of you on the council professed to be part of. The initiative and referendum process was an inherent part of democracy. It was a check upon entrenched interests and it was a check, frankly, on councils. It has been 90 years since the Texas Supreme Court has refused to put a ballot measure that was certified on the ballot. And there's a reason for that. The leading cases, by the way, against or for putting things on the ballot, for councils that refuse to put things on the ballot, are all from Austin. 
we profess more respect for democracy than we seem to practice. But let me get to the point. In a democracy, we do not interfere with elections, absent extraordinary circumstances. They interfere with elections in Iran, Venezuela, Russia, and other places that do not respect the wishes of the voters and do not understand that all power, including yours, comes from the consent of the governed. The courts, although your lawyer that you hired did not note this, the courts avoid at all possible, all possibility, interfering with the public's right to vote on initiatives. Out of deference to the public, failing to put something on the ballot, interfering with an election, is like dropping a nuclear bomb in the middle of our democratic processes. The courts do not do it except in the rarest of circumstances. And there is only one recognized extraordinary circumstance other than failure to get the signatures. And we've gotten the signatures. And that is that the entire petition matter has been removed with, as the courts call it, unmistakable clarity, end quote, from the initiative process. In other words, the whole matter that's in the petition has been withdrawn from the field of initiative and referendum. As one court said, it only can be kept off the ballot if there's literally nothing for the public to vote on. And therefore, you're not intruding into their democratic rights because there is nothing for them to vote on. Let's be very clear. We know that most of the code and expedition does not involve the only thing you say, your lawyers say, has been removed from the process. That's zoning. 1,400 of the 1,500 pages of Code Next have absolutely nothing to do with zoning. There is no one you can pay who will argue that affordable housing is not subject to initiative, that transportation is not subject to initiative, that water quality is not subject to initiative. In fact, we know it is because they, Bill Bunch had to litigate the case against that council. Transportation policy is subject to initiative. The only argument is whether a part of this is subject to initiative or not, and that's zoning. And the courts have made it clear that unless it's all been withdrawn from the field and the election would be a nullity, that you're not supposed to interfere with the public's right to vote. And you may take that lightly, but I don't. We are very lucky to live in a democracy. When we're long gone, no one's going to care how many buildings we built and how rich we were. They will be concerned about whether we are a democratic institution or not. So do the right thing. Do not take the anti-democratic action of preventing this from going on the ballot. Thank you. Mayor. Mr. Lewis, I have a quick question for you. Yes, sir. So I, I hear your opinion on the transportation, watershed, non-zoning portions. Is it, do you have an opinion on whether or not the interpretation on zoning being placed on the ballot is well, it can be an initiative or not. What I was trying to say is the courts, there, there, there's only one part that's in dispute. No, I, I, hear, I, I hear what I you're trying to say. I want to know that it part. It is subject to initiative and referendum. I spared you the details of the law. I think we'll probably have to deal with that in court. But the point, the point about it is if there's something to put on the ballot, you put it on the ballot. The courts will deal later if the voters pass it. Because if the voters don't pass it, there's nothing for the court to decide. And that's what the Colson case was saying. Stay out of it, city councils, because you may not have to interfere with an election, because there may be no legal issues if people don't approve it. And also that you should stay out of it, out of deference to the people's right to legislate by initiative. So the bottom line is what happens is you order an election, people vote. If people want to have a suit, it, let's say it doesn't pass, we have no case in controversy. If it passes 
and people want to have an argument about zoning and want to have an argument about severing that, we do it after the public has voted, not before. Because to do otherwise is to preempt the rights of the voter prematurely. I, I hear your answer on that. Just to the, the question that I, the, I, and I heard that throughout your testimony, and mm -hmm. but the, to the zoning question, so your answer is that, that you think that that is in dispute, but you think that it can be. I believe the zoning matter is subject to initiative, but I think it's irrelevant. And actually, Sorry, Heidi, gave, I think Heidi gave time to Kelly Davis. I don't need Kelly, uh, Heidi's time. She gave it to somebody else. So, so you're just going to take three minutes, three minutes? for me. Yep. Okay. And then uh, uh, after uh, you speak, then uh, Susana Amanza is up. Uh, Susana here. Thank you. Is uh, uh, Sarah Spites here? Now just checking on that. You'll have five minutes. Go ahead. All right, Mayor Kelton, my name is Bobby Levinsky. I'm here with the Save Our Springs Alliance. I do want to address that question that you just asked actually before I begin, because if you look at chapter 211.015E, it actually very clearly says that the city council has the authority to put forward a zoning ordinance before the public and have it ratified by the voters before it becomes into effect, and that's exactly what this petition is doing. So the question of whether Code Next is zoning is slightly irrelevant because I feel, I feel like that provision is what we're talking about here today. But um, I can really respect the opinions of the people who um, are not fans of the petition, who didn't sign it, or who will choose to vote against it. Um, it took me some time, actually, to get comfortable with signing the petition myself. But what I don't understand here is the effort to prevent the petition from moving forward to the voters. Um, over 30,000 Austinites filed a petition demanding a vote on this petition. Um, I want to emphasize something that Fred Lewis said on that. Um, in November, the vote is on the petition itself. The, the November is not a vote on Code Next. It's not a vote on zoning. So that question comes later. Um, the council chose, uh, when the city clerk validated the petition, the city council had two options, whether to either adopt the ordinance or put it before the voters. The council chose not to adopt the ordinance, and that's perfectly fine. That was within your right. But now I feel like it's your statutory obligation for the city council to move this decision to the voters. Um, attorneys, ar attorneys argue all the time. I get it. Um, I can argue two sides of the coin all the time. I do it a lot. Um, but that's not really the job here today. The job for the city council is to respect the will of the voters and the signatories. At best, this is a gray area of the law. And when you have a gray area of the law, you try to decide what your default position should be. For me, the the default position is very clearly the voters, um, the signatories to the petition. Uh, the power of referendum is one that is reserved by the people. The courts have been very consistent about that. Um, I also uh, want to end by respectfully asking that you allow the vote on the substitute motion for, uh, sorry, that you allow the vote on Councilmember Houston's motion first. Um, while I understand uh, the substitute motion procedures, I think that she's worked really hard on this and she has led on this very well. And um, I think that she and the, the signatories, the 30,000 signatories, deserve the respect of having that petition, uh, that resolution voted on first. Thank you. David King here. You're on deck. You have three minutes. Ms. Almanza, you have five minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. I'm Susan Almanza with Poder and also with the Eastern Crescent Right to Stay Coalition. And we all work to get signatures to put uh, this initiative on the ballot. And so we support putting uh, this initiative code next on the ballot and we ask you to do the same. And I think that the, we as a residents have a right to look at it because as it, as it stands now, uh, code next doesn't uh, adhere to our neighborhood plans. And Code Next doesn't preserve the existing low-income housing. And Code Next doesn't preserve the existing public participation process. And uh, Code Next uh, doesn't, uh, just because of density, doesn't provide low-income housing. And Code Next does not address the racism uh, within the city of Austin's procedures and code next will drive up the values and taxes. Uh, and this is very important, especially to the working class, the poor, and people of color.
because that not, not only for the homeowners, but also for the renters. So I think that we should have the right to vote to look at the final process of what happens within Code Next, because as it stands right now, it means total displacement and gentrification for our communities of color and other working class people. There's a conflict right now between housing as a live and social space and housing as an instrument for profit making. A conflict between housing as a home and as real estate. Uh, the hyper commodification of housing leads to new forms of risk. It leads to unaffordability and instability for everyone else. And we can see that in our everyday lives. Removing regulations and shifting power towards capital and away from residents, making land more valuable and more amenable to speculation. That's what this current code next does. So yes, we should have a voice in that process. The real estate industry does whatever it can to maintain high prices. Removing existing tenant protections would place real estate firms in a better position to reshape markets even more in their own favor. I heard this morning on KUT uh, with the Chamber of Commerce all supporting uh, this code next. And I'm sure that uh, you've probably gotten their emails and calls uh, about uh, supporting Conex because they do not see a home. They see profits and they see money. Uh, and we have seen uh, what the market is doing now, not just here in Austin, not just here in the United States, but globally. We know that right now housing is being used as just interest, that people are building luxury apartments, not just for use, but an, a way to make investments and to make more money. And there's many uh, studies that have been done that prove what is happening uh, in our communities, not just here in the United States, but to out the, throughout the world, and what the wealthy are doing in our, in our places, and the commodification of housing that is what's happening, and that is why Code Next to us is happening right here in Austin, Texas. I talked to you earlier about the East Riverside Corridor Master Plan, how Code Next is preserving that corridor master plan, even though thousands of people have been displaced from that corridor because of the zoning that was allowed. And, it's, and it isn't Code Next to continue to allow it when we, when the developers or staffers had the opportunity to say, you know what, the Master Riverside Corridor plan is displacing people. This council and the mayor has established the Anti-Gentrification Task Force, it's put together the Institutional uh, Task Force on Racism, it's developed the Office of Equity, and yet we don't see anything happening. As a matter of fact, it would be it would not be equity not to put this on the ballot. The equitable thing would be to put it on the ballot so that people would have a voice in the process because it, as it is now, it's, been, it's being driven by the Chamber of Commerce, the Board of Realtors, the bankers, uh, board of, all the people who look at it as profit. So I ask you, please put it on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Is Lauren Ross here? You'll be up next. Mr. King. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members. I'm here to urge you to please approve Council Member Houston's resolution to allow residents of Austin to vote on Code Next. Code Next will impact every property and resident in Austin for decades to come. No single act by Council has had or will have such broad and lasting impacts on the city. What are you afraid of? If residents see that Code Next is clearly good for them, they will vote for it. Council should not deny residents the opportunity to vote on one of the most important matters that will forever change Austin's destiny. During this morning's Memorial Day ceremony, I reflected on my father's military service in Korea. He eventually died from an illness as a result of his service. 
but he fought and ultimately died for the principles of democracy, including the basic tenet that government derives its power from the people. He fought against a tyrannical government. And I stand here today to continue their fight for democracy and against the tyranny of a majority of this council. Yes, I said that, the tyranny of a majority of this council. Please comply with the city charter and state law. Put code next, the code next petition on the ballot. And I would want to thank council members Houston, Poole, and Alter for supporting this resolution as well as Mayor Pro Tem Tobo. Thank you so much. Is uh, Jane Rivera here? Jane? What about uh, uh, Daniel Giannis? Yes. Daniel, you'll be up next. Uh, is Susan Lippman here? Yes. Okay, you'll have five minutes, Mr. Giannis. Ms. Ross. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Lauren Ross. I'm a part of Undoing Racism Austin and Undoing White Supremacy Austin. My teacher's at the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, a black-led multiracial organization based in New Orleans, Louisiana, have 10 principles for anti-racist organizing, and the first principle is know your history. That's why I'd like to remind you as you're considering code, putting code next on the ballot, the history of another citizen's initiative that shaped Austin's land development code and our political reality. In 1992, like today, community had gathered signatures to put the Save Our Springs referendum on the ballot. When those signatures were certified by the city clerk, the rural council refused to put the initiative on the May ballot. Rural was their initials. Ronnie Reynolds, Louise Epstein, Bob Larson, and Charles Erty were the four votes on a seven-member council to not put the referendum on the ballot. Mayor Todd, Max Knopfsiger and Gus Garcia supported our initiative. The community took the question to court. Judge Jean Muir was clear when she told council members that they were hereby commanded to forthwith call an election. And the vote was set for August. After months of community debate and engagement, when the votes were tallied, the referendum was overwhelmingly supported. Every local political candidate, including our Travis County commissioners, became SOS supporters regardless of their positions prior to that election. Sadly, the, council, the council's delay from May until August also allowed the developers time to file development applications on virtually every piece of property that would be affected and to position themselves for their developments to be protected by the state's grandfathering law. The parallels between this history and Code Next are chilling, but the lessons are clear. Only the democratic process, only a vote of the people, has the capacity to uproot and undo the racism that was baked in the Austin's Land Development Code since the very first zoning ordinance based on a 1928 master plan that envisioned the segregation of brown and black Austinites in East Austin. 26 years from now, when somebody younger than me is standing at this podium in these chambers and telling today's story, I hope that you will all be on the right side of history. Let the people vote. Thank you. Uh, is uh, 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 Ashkan Jahangiri? You'll be up next with three minutes. Proceed. Thank Mr. you, Giannis. Mayor uh, and Council Members. My name is Daniel Giannis. You know who I am. I belong to all these organizations that uh, helped uh, gather all those signatures. Um, this is about democratic process. This is something that the people, we are the government. Don't forget, you are not the government, right? You're not the government. You represent us. And so the people have spoken. And you should not get in the way of that. I congratulate those four council members who 
are willing to put uh, the ballot, the code next on the ballot. And Mayor, as I said to you a few months ago, um, you shouldn't be afraid to put it on the ballot if it's done right. And you know, I wasn't opposed to code next almost up until about two weeks ago. And I said to you, and I've said to several other council members, that uh, we could make a good document. But you know what? It's toxic. I mean, look at Code Next. It's a mess. It's absolutely a mess. But you could fix it. Our boards and commissions, you could extend the time. You could make it so that people, would, like, uh, like uh, uh, David King said, so that people could vote, could, would want to vote for it. But, you, but for you guys, those of you, the rest of you, Mr. Flanagan, uh, Greg, <laughs> Mayor, Mr. Renteria, Delia, Ms. Kitchen, the rest of you, you know what? You seem dishonest to me by not adhering to the will of the people. It seems a little creepy. And this is why the majority of people think that government sucks. Because you do these maneuvers, you know? We try and get young people to get involved in the political process. And they say, why should we? It's corrupted. You are walking that corruption road right now if you are not putting code next on the ballot for us to decide. And if you do that, between now and then, Greg, you can work really hard to make it right so that I can vote for it. You can work really hard so that this document is not another racist document. Greg, Delia, Peel, this is a racist document, dude. You are our minority council members. Those of you who are white on the council, how much longer are we going to have a racist city? Don't you want to turn away from that so that we can have a real democracy? A, a city and, and, and a government that we can be proud of. You know, I say this to you with love, y'all. I'm not just here to, 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 to tear you down and criticize you. I'm warning you that you look like dishonest people, Anne. Show me that you're not. Mayor, I still want to believe you. Your vote today will let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Ray Collins, is he here? Ray Collins? What about uh, uh, Kevin McLaughlin? He'll be up next. Please proceed, sir. Three minutes. Hi. Uh, Ashkan Jahangiri. I'm on the board of Aura, though I have a personal story for you all. In late September 2017, right after the launch of the petition aiming to maintain exclusionary zoning in Austin, I was at a climate change demonstration on UT's West Mall. A young guy with a clipboard approached me and asked me if I wanted to support, or if I did support democracy and affordable housing. He had a petition, I do support democracy and affordable housing, so I, so I signed. Shortly afterwards, I learned a lot about local politics, and I was mortified when I learned that I signed a petition that I now wholeheartedly disagree with and I vowed to never tell anyone about this. I am revealing my transgression to you so that you may consider that this petition was gathered under false pretenses. I was at other political events over the next few months and would regularly see the paid canvassers asking people if they supported affordable housing and would then get people to sign their petition. I was at the MLK Day rally. I saw the same guy who got me to sign the petition. Sure enough, he asked me if I supported affordable housing. Um, I found out that many of my friends were also tricked into signing this misleading and illegal petition, and I had no recourse. I called the city clerk after they started counting, and there's no mechanism to uh, retract your um, signature after it's handed in. So people were asked if they supported affordable housing and democracy, and they did not understand the complicated context of what they were signing. Austin is in a housing crisis because we restrict the amount of people allowed to live in the city of Austin through 20th century exclusionary zoning. As for democracy, I was also surprised to learn that the people who were created and are pushing for this petition are attorneys and activists with decades of experience in petitions and charter changes. 
So why did these experts write that this initiative petition can override the city charter? This petition has been a farce from the beginning, intended to deceive. As someone who believes in and supports organizing and community activism, I am pretty offended that supposed community leaders are committing organizing malpractice by misleading the public and wasting our time to sell exclusionary policies by packaging it as democracy. Thanks. Thank you. Is uh, Patty Sprinkle here? What about uh, Rachel Manning? What about Jeff Jack? You'll be up next. Three minutes. Go ahead, please. I'm Kevin McLaughlin. I'm an Aura board member. Uh, the people who created this petition claim that it will be more democratic or inspire a better debate. But Austin's dark, own dark history with the Fair Housing Ordinance of 1968 should make us wary of these claims. It shows that a code next referendum will actually subvert our representative democracy, you, and leave out the most vulnerable of our citizens. As I'm sure the council knows, in 1968, your predecessors courageously passed Austin's own fair housing ordinance to prohibit all forms of discrimination in housing. But a certain group of Austin property owners who claimed they wanted to, and I quote, give democracy a chance, petitioned to put the ordinance to a vote. Of course, the referendum that followed rejected fair housing, but that's not the point. In that referendum, only 27% of registered voters, 10% of the total population, voted. Of course, of course, most of the voters that did show up lived west of I-35. That's not democracy. So how about informative debate? Let me read a few uh, quotes from the information provided by the petition's advocates in 1968. Sign the petition to bring forced housing to a vote. Civil rights, fair housing, anti-discrimination policies, these sound real good, but these are a wolf in sheep's clothing. And my personal favorite, the communists know that the existing order, which it is their purpose to overthrow, is based on the sanctity of property. That kind of scaremongering sounds oddly familiar. I can almost see the fair housing Rex Austin yard signs. But if not a referendum, how should we decide on code next? You. We elected you. City councilors of Austin, Texas. Not pettifogging petition hawkers. To lead us. I have no doubt that it will be difficult, as it was no doubt difficult for the city councilors of 1968 to stand up to those who claimed to speak for the people. But stand up you must. Your courageous predecessors and our dark history demand it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jack. Is Mario Cantu here? You'll be up next, Mr. Cantu. Mr. Jack, you have three minutes. Mayor, City Council, I want to thank Council Member Houston and the other council members that have come together to put this uh, issue before you today. We urge you to vote for Council Member Houston's motion. And as uh, said earlier, it would be great if she could have her motion voted on first. But I want to give you two numbers, 6 and 81. Six is the number of council members we need to get this done. 81 is the number of neighborhood associations in the Austin Neighborhoods Council, of which I'm president. They extend all over the city. White neighborhoods, African-American neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods, east, west, south, and north. We all worked hard to get this petition done in the belief that we needed to have this vote. It's not a vote about what's on code next today, but what would be coming out of this council in the future is a check and balance for the citizens' right to petition. Please put this on the ballot. Thank you. Mr. Cantu, is uh, Kelly Davis here? Is 
Mr. Kelly Davis here? No? Okay. Mr. Cantu, you're our last speaker. Thank you. Can you hear me? There you yes. Go. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. Uh, I just wanted to give some insight uh, because there's new council members. Um, and I wanted to let everybody know that, that ANC, probably like over five years ago when this whole thing started with Code Next, uh, we were at the $1 million mark. Uh, we identified, when I say we identified ANC, I was with the ANC at that time, Austin yeah. Neighborhoods Council. And we noticed that things were kind of going a little sideways with the Code Next when it came to interaction with citizens and neighborhoods and contact teams. Uh, so we initiated a meeting with the planning department, which we did have a meeting with, and we kind of went round and round as far as uh, giving information to them on, on recommendations and things that they could do in order to better off some of the information that they could get for Code Next. Uh, we were basically ignored at that time. Uh, the next year went up to another million dollars. You know, one of the comments that I made when at that meeting is that, you know, you're, this whole thing is costing us about $19,000 a week. Uh, for $19,000 a week, I could easily take $1,000 out of that and buy tacos for almost every neighborhood association in certain parts of the town and, and get information. Uh, and those were some things that we, we said that we, you could have interaction with. And so I think, you know, basically, at, because of all that problems that we had in the past and all the suggestions and we identified so many things that were going on that were ignored from just not us but from other citizens that this is where we're at now and in we're trying to do a, a catch-up game on things and you know there's a guy that was talking earlier today that talked about band-aids and and scripts and I think that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to give a lot of prescriptions out and a lot of band-aids on things uh, we need some surgical intervention. We, we need some drastic things to be taken, and this is the route that we need to do. And I want to say thank you to the council members that are in support of this, because based on what I've seen and what I know and where we are, and then the, the consultants at that time in, in the one-year mark that were there from our city that were working with Opticos, those were the individuals that, that should have initiated what we've talked about and that did not take place, and that's why we're in this problem that we're in now. Thank you. Thank you. There are three uh, additional people that have signed up. Uh, Roger Baker. Mr. Baker, you have three minutes. And then Barbara MacArthur uh, will be on deck. Does this one work? I guess it does. It does. Uh, first of all, Code Next is a mess, and if the petition never comes to vote, I think we'll almost certainly fail. All you got to do is read the Austin Chronicle to know the details on that. Uh, and I believe we have a right to vote uh, on the petition, despite the political power of the real estate lobby. And... Uh, you have group, you have uh, power brokers like Rika, who want to use gentrification to raise taxes in the fastest possible growth forever, and thus force existing homeowners out of the city. I think the big money boys are scared of a vote uh, for communities. You know, that you'd almost certainly fail. Uh, the communities of color are the low-hanging fruit. You know, if you get something like Code Next that weakens all the regulations on development, they're the ones who are going to get screwed the worst. And I know some of them. You know, they're, they're activists on the east side, and they realize what's going on. Anyway, I applaud the council members who actually voted for democracy. That feels so good to happen once in a while. So... I'll support you all, and I hope this thing gets on the ballot because we, I, I helped to get it on, I helped to get it there. You know, I worked hard because I believe in democracy, and I hope you support it. And, uh, you know, pro the, uh, the real estate interests are sort of a shadow government in this town because there's so much money to be made off of that. So remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Is Robert Corbin here? 
Corbin, Thank you'll be up next uh, for three minutes. Go ahead, Ms. MacArthur. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I think the community of Austin of existing residents who live in modest homes and modest neighborhoods are facing increased entitlements and code necks that will finish our displacement. We know you want our dirt and your policies and mapping turn over our dirt for profit. To us, our housing is not a structure, it is our community. Housing is not supply and demand, and it is an investment commodity, and no matter what the supply here, there's enough money in our state, our country, and the world to gobble up that commodity as soon as it is produced. Increased supply has not brought down prices in any desirable city in the whole world, and this is from a world-famous economist. So the key to making housing more affordable in this country is not to build more, but to stop the flow of cash flooding into expensive areas. Build more without doing this and prices won't fall. The market will simply absorb more cash. What my immigrant friend always says is, follow the money. I urge you to support the Council Member Houston's motion. When I talk to my kids and their friends in the 20 to 40 age demographic, they ask, how can you change the whole city and we don't get to vote? We don't even get a supermajority vote. And then we are told that it's not good for certain parts of town to vote that we should let the representat representatives vote for them instead. So how long ago was it, it was argued that women shouldn't have the right to vote? And how many of you can think that our electrical co electoral college did a better job of selecting a president than our Democratic vote did in the last election? Mr. Corbin, and I think that my records indicate that Mr. Corbin's the last speaker. Uh, so if anybody else has signed up and I've missed them, you need to come on down. Mr. Corbin. Uh, I don't know too much about Code Next right now. It's been probably three months since I've looked at it. Probably whatever it is, I will probably benefit financially if you go ahead and do what would be the bad thing and not let the citizens vote on this. However, since there was a petition signed by citizens, and to my knowledge that petition is legal, and there's no reason to not believe that it wasn't legal, then you should honor those people that signed that petition and put it to a vote of the people. Otherwise, the whole purpose of this seems like it's just to override the will of the people. So please uh, follow uh, Council Member Houston's amendment and uh, make it right. Thank you. Thank you. Council, I think that's all the people that we have uh, uh, signed up to, uh, to speak uh, on this. That brings us up to the, uh, up to the dais uh, so that we can have uh, uh, discussion uh, on this. Yeah. Does anyone want to speak first? Councilman Paul? Um, and to respond to a number of calls from our speakers today, I would like to ask, please, um, and if I don't know if it's a point of order or personal privilege or what, but I would like very much to give Councilmember Houston and the three of us who were her co-sponsors the opportunity to get a vote on the first resolution that has been out that was offered. Um, I, I understand that you have a substitute that you would like to take up, and, and so we can do that next, uh, assuming that the vote on Council Member Houston's resolution doesn't, doesn't stand. But I would ask the dais, please, to allow us to have a vote on the resolution that is before us first and that many people have worked really hard to craft. So the way that uh, I would handle this is consistent with how we've handled all these. Uh, we would, with the substitute motion, uh, enable people to have the chance to, to amend that. We put that aside. We would ask for amendments on the main, the original motion, Ms. Houston, and I don't care which order we do that one in. We can't but hear we'll you. Have, sorry. The way I'm, I would intend to handle this is the way that I've handled all of these. Uh, we'll first take uh, amendments uh, to uh, uh, either the, uh, I'll take amendments to the, the initial motion first, if people want to make them. Uh, we'll then take amendments to the substitute motion, and then we'll take a vote on uh, whether or not we're to consider the substitute motion. 
If that passes, then we'll take a vote and consider the substitute motion. If the motion for the substitute motion does not pass, uh, then we will take up and consider the uh, original motion. But that's the form that I would uh, follow because it's consistent with how we have always done these. So we're now taking debate. Certainly someone could challenge that if they wanted to. Ms. Kitchen? Um, I don't, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the substitute motion hasn't actually been laid out, so I'm not sure if the public understands it. Uh, I don't know when in this process you want to do that, but it might be appropriate when you're ready. And I'd like to do that. I was going to give uh, uh, Ms. Houston or someone sure. the opportunity to explain the main motion just before I did that, and then I was going to lay out the substitute and, and why I uh, laid out the substitute. And, and I don't think we have actually put a motion on the on the table yet. Yeah, we did. So we did. We had mm -hmm. motions. We had both of them. Who was the second Council, on it? Council. Okay, thank you. We had the main motion. So, so could you... Okay. So, so I think any... we need to have an, another round, another run at your explanation, Mayor, of how you want to manage the two motions so that we have some clarity there. Okay. Um, first, first we're going to do is okay. we're going to add amendments to each of them. So we'll take one up. We'll make any amendments to it that people will. It's, it's like going in and out. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll take up one. We'll make amendments to it until we're done making amendments to it. Then we'll take up the other. We'll make amendments to it until we're done taking the amendments to it. And then we'll vote on the motion to substitute, which will be the council answering the question, do you want to consider the substitute instead of the original motion? If that passes, then we'll take a vote on the substitute, yes or no. So we if are that taking, does not pass. So we are taking we'll take, up Councilmember Houston's. I'm just trying to follow. We are taking up Councilmember Houston's motion first. We're going to take up Councilmember again. We're going to take up as the procedure for a substitute motion. We'll take amendments to one of them. We'll take amendments to Miss Houston's motion because the rules say that you can consider either of them first in that case. So we'll take up Ms. Houston's motion first and see if anybody wants to make any amendments to it, and we'll consider those. Then we'll take Ms. Houston's motion and we'll put it aside. Then we'll take up the substitute motion, see if anybody wants to make any amendments to it until we're done. And at that point, then, we'll consider the motion to substitute, which is the motion on the, on the dais. And the question will be, do you want to consider the substitute instead of Ms. Houston's motion? Okay. There'll be a vote on that. And depending on that vote will then tell us whether we're considering the substitute or whether we're considering Ms. Houston's motion. And we'll take a vote. So, so Mayor, that's very confusing to me. I would like for you to, to, to talk for just a moment about, because I, I suggested in the beginning that if you don't like my base motion, the one that was posted initially, vote against it. You said that you would rather not do that because you've got some other things. Could you point out what are the differences between your resolution that would be, um, that you would like to leave in that are not in the original resolution, other than the obvious? So there are three resolved clauses in the substitute as it was posted yesterday. The first one is resolved that the council determines not to place the matter on the November 6, 2018 ballot. The second resolve clause says that we want to take action today in doing that more quickly than is required by law to ensure that there is ample time and opportunity uh, for legal challenges to the council's action so as to not preclude the opportunity to have the item placed on the next allowable municipal election. And then the third, be it resolved clause, places the item on the November 6, 2018 ballot if a court, pursuant to a challenge of the action otherwise, determines that the city of Austin was under a legal requirement to place the matter on the ballot since we didn't adopt the petition ordinance. Those are the three components. Okay, so does anybody, I would now recognize for, for debate. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. I have questions about how that differs from the main motion, um, and I'm not sure if now is the appropriate time to have that, to ask those questions. I would say 
I continue to have concerns about, I think I've, I've seen various ways of handling substitute motions, and I'm not sure that the best way is the one that we've used most recently, where we spend time amending two resolutions before we determine which one. I mean, I'm going to be in a position of making amendments that bring your resolution into alignment with Council Member Houston's in the event that we don't have an opportunity to vote on Council Member Houston's. I, don't, I just don't think it's an efficient use of our time or, or particularly effective. But we can choose not to have that discussion here today, but I would like to schedule some time at a work session to have that discussion about substitute motions and making amendments to two very separate actions and whether that's a great use of our time or really um, terribly productive. But anyway, if, I, I just want to talk, I guess, ask a couple questions about the three resolves. I've gone through the rest of the resolution. It seems um, similar, extremely similar to Council Member Houston's in most respects until we get to the Viet resolves. The main difference, as I see it, is the first Viet resolved. This would have the City Council saying it will not place the aforementioned petition on the ballot. The next one is just more of a commentary that we're taking this action more quickly than re required by law to ensure ample time for any potential legal challenges. I don't think that's inconsistent with Councilmember Houston's and the, or the resolution that we've brought forward. I think that would be, I mean, that provides more, more information. So I don't see that inconsistent with the action being directed in Councilmember Houston's. And then I guess the last resolved requires me to, um, I would like a little bit of an explanation about it. As I, as I read that, it's saying, if a court orders us to place the matter on the ballot, we'll place the matter on the ballot. Would we have another option in that circumstance if a court requires us to place something on the ballot? I don't know, because I don't know what the court's ruling would say. So I'm just making really clear uh, the, what I hope to be the intent of the council. But if the, if the court determined that the city of Austin was under a legal requirement to place the matter on the ballot, I mean, it's basically saying we'll place it on the ballot if a court requires us to place the matter on the ballot. Well, part of that depends on when the court rules. So I don't know how that, I don't know when the court would rule, if there was a challenge. Uh, and I just want to be really clear about that intent and that act. That we would, but is the intent, I mean, am I, am I missing something? Are we just saying we intend to comply with the law if we're required to put it on the ballot? It says how we're going to comply with the law. In terms of the timing, or? Uh huh. And it also expresses the intent of the body. To comply with the law. You could certainly vote against it if you'd like. Well, I, I mean, I'm all in support of our complying with the law. <clears throat> no, I just keep saying it, and you keep asking me the same question. I'm just trying and to figure out if there's something else that, I mean, that would, too, I think, be consistent with certainly the spirit of Council Member Houston. So the main, the main difference seems to me that first be it resolved. We would be, affir we would be saying we were not, um, we're determining not to place it on the, on the ballot versus Council, versus the main motion, which is to place it on the ballot. Is that It's really how important you see to me difference? to make all three of those statements, and that's why I brought the substitute. Okay. I guess my point is both of those, two of the three, could probably be added into the main motion and have it still be ballot. So I guess, I guess my, my preference remains that we take up the main motion. And you'll get a chance to be able to, to, to take that vote. You've talked about this. I'm happy to, to lay out mine and, and speak to it. So let me go ahead and do that. I think, you know, in, in all these debates and in the discussion and in Code Next, uh, it's, we have, you know, parts of the community that uh, are obviously widely divergent in views, uh, and we've had uh, uh, on both sides, on all sides, a uh, significant amount of hyperbole uh, used in the debate and the discussion, uh, and I, I think that's unfortunate. But for today's vote, whether someone is for Code Next or against Code Next, is, is absolutely 
immaterial. And I agree with the, uh, the speakers that, uh, that, that said that. Because we can't be governed in this vote as to whether or not we want or don't want code next. The only issue before us is, is this something that under law is susceptible of legally being put on a ballot? If it's susceptible of being legally put on a ballot, then we have a ministerial duty to put it on the ballot. But if it's not legally susceptible of being put on the ballot, then it would be wrongful for us to do that. So we had our city attorneys take a look at the question, and they came back and told us, in their opinion, this was not legally put on a ballot, was not susceptible of being put on a ballot, and it would be wrong for us to put it on the ballot. They then went out and got uh, uh, an opinion from uh, an independent counsel who came back with the same conclusion. I then reached out to the dean of the law school, and I asked the dean of the law school if there was, if he or someone on his faculty had an expertise in this area and could take a look at this as an institution in the city that wasn't being hired or retained by one side or the other, or hadn't been involved in the petition process on either side. And the dean put me in touch with a member of the faculty. A member of the faculty suggested that in something like this, it would be best for me to ask the, uh, one of the leading experts in the country on municipal law, probably better somebody that was outside of, of, of Austin. And I was referred to uh, uh, Clayton Gillette with the New York University Law School. Uh, he asked for and, and was sent um, uh, some of the, the, our charter, the initiative petition. And he concluded that the opinions that were given us by the independent counsel and by our legal staff were correct that this was not something that was legally susceptible of being put on a ballot. What he said was that the general rule concerning zoning was that you can put on the ballot the question of whether or not the city should have zoning. Do you want to have zoning? You do that in the instance where you have a city like Houston that doesn't have any zoning. You can certainly put on the ballot, do you want to have zoning? Or you can go to a city where their zoning already exists, like Austin, and you could put on the ballot the question of whether or not zoning should be stricken in the city, whether you should go to a city like Houston that has no zoning. But those were the only two questions that you could put on the ballot. You weren't allowed to put on the ballot uh, the question of whether or not people liked a particular uh, zoning scheme. That was stated as the, as the general rule. Would you put up, uh, please, on the overhead what's been marked as, as number one? I marked that as number one for the, for the clerk. This is uh, section 211.015 of the local government code. I think we've probably all seen this a lot of times. This is uh, uh, Local Government Code 211.015. It is our state statute that concerns zoning referendum. And it describes pretty, uh, pretty clearly when it is that you can do zoning. And I imagine it's no surprise that it's consistent with the general rule that, that, that we had earlier been told. You can see that in section A, it speaks about zoning to be allowed under an initial adoption of zoning. Section B, you can see it talks about repeal in its entirety of zoning. 
Section C, again, it speaks to the initial adoption of zoning. And Section E, it says the provisions of this whole section may only be utilized for the repeal of a municipality's zoning regulations in their entirety or for determinations of whether municipalities should initially adopt zoning regulations. So our state law, unsurprising, is consistent with the, with the general rule. I just want to make <coughs> reference, because I think it's fair that, that, that I address some of the arguments that have been raised by, by some of the folks that have spoken today in, in the community, um, because I think they, they, they deserve a, a response and, and just to see. There's a case uh, that's uh, uh, handed out it's, it's number two as I handed it to you. It's uh, the uh, N. Ray Arnold case. If you could pull up that case, please. Uh, on the uh, one, two, three, fourth page uh, in that case, there's a paragraph that's in orange that's kind of surrounded with yellow. So it's a case that looks like this. There's a two in the bottom left-hand corner. And the fourth page of that, about three quarters the way down, has uh, a paragraph that's highlighted in orange. It's on the left side. Mayor, can you look to the left, the page to the left? Mayor, can we get copies of that, please, at the dais? Uh-huh. I'd like to get copies of that at the dais, uh -huh. please. Thank you. These are the cases that uh, uh, our council uh, gave us and pointed out to uh, some, some time ago. Uh huh. Yes. So the, the, the first language to point out is its confirming language. It says the statute allows the use of the referendum process for voters to repeal a city's zoning regulation in their entirety or to determine whether the city should initially adopt zoning regulations but does not allow it for amendment of individual zoning determinations on properties. All you can put up is the question of do you want zoning in the city or do you not want zoning in the city? But one reason I pulled up this case is because if you looked at the next page, uh, footnote four in the case, it addresses the uh, issue that has been raised about whether or not, even if this is illegal and not susceptible of a ballot, should we put it on the ballot anyhow and then ask a court to look at it after the fact? So if you could put onto the screen footnote four, it's that same case. It's just, uh, I think it's like on the next page. Is it in this, Mayor? Because I'm not, I'm not finding that. It's the same that. case. It's footnote four. So that, is that You can like see page footnotes four? after the conclusion. It says footnotes. Does it you start, go down to footnote four. Does it start with realtors It further? does. It does. Got it. And, and realtors, in this instance, has nothing to do with somebody who's involved in buying or selling real estate. This is a mandamus action before a court where the parties are coming in and, 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 and asking for the court to order a clerk or, or a government official to do something. And that's what that, you know, the parties call that. But it says realtor further contends that the real parties and in interest, and that's just the other side in the case, may not decline to hold an election based on a belief that a proposed legislation would violate the law if adopted and must instead defer to a court ruling regarding the alleged illegality. However, this doctrine has no application to this case because it concerns the real party's refusal to hold an election on the grounds that the election itself, not the proposed legislation, would violate the law. And that's the case that we have here. The reason this does not go on the ballot has nothing to do with, with any infirmities in the law itself. Even those sections of it that we know are illegal, like 
this ordinance overrules the state charter and the and and I mean the city charter and and state law, which we know it it can't do. But the basis for putting this on the ballot or not putting this on the ballot is not that. It's that holding the election itself on zoning, as we've seen, since this is not a vote to have initial have zoning for an initial time or to it, remove zoning in its entirety because that question goes to whether or not the election itself is proper. That's why this is not something that you tee up for a court to, to decide uh, and then, and then uh, hold the election and then go to, again, then go to the court. Um, And there, there are other cases that, 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 that suggest the, the, the same rule in instances where people are trying to get a determination of, of zoning questions less than are you going to initially adopt zoning or are you going to strike zoning in its uh, entirety. Now, if you go back to the first thing that we had, if you would, which is the state statute. I want everyone to take just a second and look at uh, subsection D. I think it's the section that Mr. Levinsky talked about in his testimony. I think he referred to it as subsection E, uh, but I think he was referring to subsection D. If you put that up, please. So look at subsection D. So, so we have initial adoption or repeal in its entirety throughout this section, except in subsection D. In subsection D, the words don't appear. And it says, notwithstanding any charter provision to the contrary, a governing body of a municipality may adopt a zoning ordinance and condition its taking effect upon the ordinance receiving the approval of the electors at an election held for that purpose. Now, it's been suggested that this means that we can do something that all the other sections have not let us do, and that's to have an election on something other than the initial adoption or the repeal in its entirety. That doesn't make sense to me because it would contradict the whole rest of the statute. I think a much more reasonable interpretation of this is to look at things like happened in Houston, where the city council wanted to put before the voters the question of whether or not the city should have zoning or not. And they adopted a zoning ordinance so that the people who were voting in that later election would know what they were going to get if they decided they wanted to have zoning, which was the only question in front of them. In that case, the governing body adopted a zoning ordinance conditioned upon the voters approving it later on. This is an important provision because if this provision wasn't here, then a city council can't adopt a zoning ordinance to let people know what it might look like if they adopted because they don't have the authority to adopt the zoning ordinance. So somewhere they have to be able to adopt a zoning ordinance even if it's contingent and perspective on a later vote, up or down, do you want to have zoning, do you not want to have zoning? But you don't have to take my interpretation for section D on that just in case anybody was confused about what D meant, the legislature wrote E, which says the provisions of this section, that's A, B, C, D, and E, may only be utilized for the repeal of a municipality's zoning regulations in their entirety or for the determinations of whether a municipality should initially adopt zoning regulations. It's been suggested that, that, that even though clearly the uh, referendum ordinance deals with zoning, it also deals with things other than zoning, and therefore we ought to be able to put it on the ballot. The problem is that we're not allowed to pick sections to put on the ballot. 
when someone takes an initiative and gets people to sign it, the only, if it's going to be put on the ballot, then the governing body, the city council, has to put it on the ballot exactly the way that it went to the people who were signing the petition. Which means we can't take out the parts that are offending, leave in parts that might not be offending. We have no choice because it's illegal and improper for us to put this zoning matter in front of the voters. The last thing I want to address is the SOS ordinance case. There were two SOS cases. Uh, there was the uh, initial uh, SOS uh, uh, case, which was the uh, City Council of Austin versus Save Our Springs, and then the second one, which was Austin v. Quick. In the first one, City of Council of Austin versus Save Our Springs, that was a case that, as you may recall, those of us that were around, uh, that concerned the timing for when this would be put on the ballot. The question was, was it put in the spring, which would have required uh, the council to set it uh, uh, pretty quickly, but they could have set it then, or waiting until August for a longer period of time. Uh, there was a vote by the city council to try to set it at the earlier date. There were insufficient votes to pass it because there were too many abstentions, uh, so they didn't set it. And then it went up to the court to determine whether or not there was responsibility to set it in the May election or the August election. The court ultimately determined that setting it in the August election was proper. It was set for the August, August election, and the election was held. But the second case, I think, is the one that, that's more instructive for where we are. That's the Austin v. Quick case, which was the challenge to the SOS ordinance itself. And one of the challenges to the SOS ordinance was that it wasn't proper to be put on the initiative because it was a zoning ordinance, and we all know you can't put zoning ordinances on there. The defense to that was not that it's proper to put zoning ordinances on the ballot. I think reasonably so, because I would have violated the general rule. But the argument was that it wasn't a zoning ordinance at all, uh, which is exactly what the court found. The court found that SOS was not a um, uh, zoning matter, uh, but what rather was a water quality control ordinance intended to ensure water quality. Therefore, it was not zoning ordinance and did not fall under the general rule. You know, I, I, this, the easy thing to do here would be just to put this on the ballot and then we could just walk away. But that wouldn't be right because it wouldn't be legal. For me, it would be a denial of the oath of office that I, that I took. I wasn't elected to do the easy thing. I was elected to do the hard thing when it was the right thing. I bring this uh, substitute today because putting this on the ballot is not proper under law. In fact, I haven't heard any lawyer unattached with the petition drive suggest that it's something that we could put on the ballot. I'm not sure that the attorneys that are doing this for the petition drive actually think that it really could go on the ballot. But in any event, I think it is important for us to honor the people that participated uh, in, in this. And to that end, uh, I think it's important for us to do several things. One of those is to do what the law requires us to do, which is section one. But section two is to make sure that, that we, we put it on, on the ballot quickly, even though we're not required to take this action until August. I think we should take this action now, take it quickly, so as to give the, uh, anyone who would want to challenge it the greatest opportunity to have someone check our paper. I think that was the language earlier. To provide that opportunity so that our paper can be checked. Let's get it into court if, the challenge, if there's a challenge, and then let a court decide. And then in the third section to say we're going to put this on the ballot uh, uh, if that is the, the direction 
that is uh, uh, given to us uh, by the, the court. I also think that there are other things we can do in the spirit of the, of the petition, which asks for uh, a delay of implementation period and the like. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, several of us have called for that and, and asked the staff to provide for that. Uh, and the schedule that we got suggested to us yesterday from staff uh, included a delay period of time uh, so that we can, uh, in fact, uh, uh, honor that. I think that this uh, substitute allows us to honor the petition to the fullest extent possible as allowed by law, but has us doing what I believe to be the, uh, uh, the only option that we have consistent with the oath that we've taken. Councilmember Kitchen. Um, I, um, let me just start by saying that, um, as I've said before, that this is not easy for any of us, those of us who've been working on the, those of you who have been working on the petition and those of us on the dais who are doing our best to carry out the oath that we took when we became council members. So I think I am, and I am one that, and I thank you for laying out uh, the situation that's in front of us in terms of the, in terms of the law. Um, I think that uh, we don't have the authority to put this on the ballot. But with that said, what we're really trying to do, and I think that this substitute does, is we're trying to honor the public's ability to vote. I think the only route to doing that is to get this in front of a judge as soon as possible. You know, some of, uh, I think Mayor Pro Tem had asked what is different between this substitute and what's on table, on the table. This substitute doesn't wait till June 14th. This substitute is written such that it would be clear that this could be taken to a judge now. So this is the route from my perspective that allows us to honor the public's concern and question and request, which I would, you know, I would do in a heartbeat and I support. I'm trying to support a route that gets us there. And I think that does that. And the second thing it does is it makes it very clear and that we are voting to put this on the ballot. Again, if, it, if a court finds that it's legal. I want to vote to put this on the ballot. And that's why I am voting on this substitute motion because I can vote to put it on the ballot and it sets a route to make it, to answer that question of whether it's legal, which I, everything is telling me now it's not. I would love for a judge to tell me that it is. So I think that this substitute is the, the way for us to, to get to a point where we can have a judge decide. I mean, people have said different things that have testified to us and have talked to us about being judge and jury, have talked to us about, you know, not subverting the will of the people, have talked to us about honoring democracy. All of those things I respect and I agree with, and this is the route that gets us there. Because I'm not asking, because, well, as I've already explained, this is the route that I believe gets us there, and so I'm gonna support the substitute motion. Further discussion on the dais. Council Member Alter. Thank you. Um, full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer, and on days like this, I'm really thankful that I didn't become a lawyer. Um, I also don't sit on a judicial body um, here. Um, what confuses me is our citizens have certain rights that are given to them by the state. And we have on one hand said, um, this is initial zoning so you don't have valid petition rights. And on the other hand, we're saying, 
this isn't initial zoning until you don't have petition rights. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but I cannot figure that out and how we can say on one hand, it's initial zoning, so you don't have all petition rights. And on the other hand, um, you don't have petition rights because it's not initial zoning. And we, somewhere along the lines, we are not protecting the rights of our citizens, and I'm having trouble with that. Um, the second thing that I wanted to ask is I wanted to invite Mr. Levinsky up to speak to the legal points, because I'm not a lawyer, um, and, and help us to think this through. I appreciate the mayor laying it out and um, walking us through that, but um, one thing I've definitely learned is that part of being a lawyer is understanding their multiple perspectives. And um, since I don't have a legal background, I'd like to invite Mr. Levinsky to respond to some of the points that were made that you feel merit um, further explanation. Sure, I do appreciate that. And I can't respond to everything because I was only just giving my opinion on one particular section. Um, and in my legal opinion, actually, I do believe that this petition can be put forward on the ballot. Um, I don't like my motive being questioned for that. Um, but I do respect um, Councilmember Kitchen's point um, because you haven't been convinced and I do believe that you are trying to get an avenue to get this to get this resolved. So I do appreciate that. I really um, I appreciate your comments. Um, with regard to uh, the initial zoning conversation, that's exactly, I think you really hit the nail on the head there because throughout the entire Code Next process, our residents have been told that because uh, the uh, comprehensive revision to our land development code it is set out as more of a repeal of the existing code and replacement of a new code. It's more similar in nature to an initial zoning because that's uh, the way Chapter 211 is, uh, is, uh, is drafted. You have two ways you can do zoning. You can do zoning through an initial zoning or, you, or original zoning, and you can do uh, zoning through amendments. It's, this is clearly not an amendment, and I don't think anybody is, is arguing that. Um, and that's all the court cases that have been referenced have to do with amendments. They're not, they don't have to do with comprehensive revisions. So on one hand, we have our legal department suggesting that uh, with the original zoning conversation that, that it, the comprehensive revision is clearly falls under initial zoning. When you get down to chapter 211.015, it does talk about initial zoning, but those court cases that have, that have, sought, to, um, that have sought to try to distinguish between chapter 211 and zoning, or chapter 211.015 and zoning, they have all talked about repealing things all at once in an entirety. And that's true. That's exactly what this petition's doing. It's, but it's, the only thing that's different is it's not really repealing. It's just making it conditional upon approval, as that language in chapter 211.015D says, is that you can make condition upon the approval of uh, the voters. And that next section, E, only speaks to repeal. It does not speak to uh, making something conditional. So I tried to make that point in that letter that I, I, I clearly was written, uh, read by somebody. But um, that's, that's the point that I was trying to make with that, is that there, that's just one of the avenues that you can get there. I know that Mr. Lewis has made other arguments. And I know that Mr. Bunch has made other arguments. Um, and I do believe that both of them also believe that this is legally put forward before the voters. So thank you. I'll let someone else speak. Mr. Flanagan. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for bringing this substitute. And, and um, you know, I, I, I've made plenty of statements that I, I don't think it's a good idea to vote on code next, but I, but I definitely agree with Councilmember Kitchen on this point. If we're wrong about that, then we need to have the courts say so. It seems very clear in the, the local government code that you can only do the entire repeal or the initial adoption that Part D section you can't take out of context. You have to take in context with the whole ordinance. In fact, Part E begins with the provisions of this section may only be utilized. So clearly, Part D also only applies to repeal in their entirety or initial adoption. So I, I think it's very clear, as Council Member Kitchen, you laid out. Um, but but to the, the folks that have talked about Save Our Springs, I, I think it's a really uh, good counterpoint because we want to avoid a situation where this debate over the legality of the of the ballot measure means we miss an election date. We want to expedite this resolution as quickly as we can. I think the substitute motion does a better job of definitively doing that. 
Um, I think, reasonably speaking, no matter what choice we made, there was likely to be legal action from some party. But it seems much clearer to me that by definitively saying now that we won't do it, and that the reason why we're saying that now is to then facilitate this legal decision, and that whatever that legal decision says, we will expedite our process as a city to then fulfill that order, I think is the cleanest and simplest way to go about this. It helps us eliminate this uh, uh, trying to make the dais a judicial body. It is a legislative body, and so I think we are making our legislative decision that it is not proper to put it on the ballot because we are interpreting the laws as we do when we interpret the charter, as we do when we interpret anything, when we make any decision. Um, I, I do have a question for Councilmember Alter because I've been looking for the staff analysis that talks about valid petition rights. Was there a memo? I mean, this is really clerical. Was there a memo that talked about that that I missed somewhere about why Code Next doesn't trigger valid petition rights? Uh, it's funny that you asked that. I believe I asked Mr. Pantalian um, for that the other day to have where that was written. It's my understanding that there were statements that were made um, in that regard, but I don't have the memo in front of me if there was one. That's okay. I mean, we don't have to dig into it right now. I, they, they were I, think, I think it's a valid point. If, if, if you're if, if your recitation of that reasoning holds, then I think there's something to resolve there. I think it's much clearer that the local government code 211 supersedes anything else we might do. But um, so that's why I, I, I'm, I'm willing to dig into that issue further on the valid petition right side, but it seems very clear in this moment that we should be passing the substitute motion to get us to this most proper and legal resolution as quickly as we can. Mayor Pro Tem. So I, pre the, I appreciate the conversation about um, the need to get us to resolution on this as, as soon as possible. I just want to point out that both resolutions would place this matter, they're both working with the same date. And so it, it, there was, I don't, I probably was misunderstanding some of the conversation, but I don't. I don't want any members of the public to think that the main resolution, which was asking the staff to go forward and draft the language to place this on the ballot, was thinking about any ballot other than November. It was working toward the same aim, too. It was just acknowledging that whenever we're putting something on the ballot, it happens in at least two steps, in that you, we take action and direct the city manager to prepare the ballot language. And so as far as that goes, that piece was happening expeditiously. Um, we're trying to go back and forth here. Well, if somebody um, else needs to speak, that's fine. I don't mind waiting. Uh, Ms. Houston, why don't you go ahead? Mayor, I, you know, I'm just always amazed at your legal expertise, and I really, I really do appreciate that. Of course, half the stuff I don't understand, but it's it, you, you, you well researched, you understand the law, and you present it in a way that's uh, very compelling. Um, and um, however, um, there are other people who are as learned that say something different. And so uh, rather than just keep going back and forth on the legal arguments, um, I'd like to just move that we vote on my, my uh, resolution and see if it um, passes or fails. And then if not, rather than doing that amendment stuff, which gets very confusing, not only for the people on the dais, but the people in the community, let's just vote it. And if it fails, then we'll move on to your substitute. And then we can make, oh, you can make amendments to mine. But I, I think that going back and forth between both is very difficult for people to keep up with. And I understand that. I, what we're going to do, I think, is really simple, too. You made a motion. I made a motion to substitute it. We'll take a vote on my motion to substitute, uh, because that's that's the order of the business that we that we do. Further discussion, Mr. Ria. You know, uh, I try to to. You know, when I got elected, I uh, I made a commitment that I wasn't going to do any damage to this city, and. Uh, and I knew that, that uh, on Code Next, the way the petition was written, the way they explained to me, that there was going to be a lawsuit either way because 
we were doing something illegal. You know, but in order, I got this here in the mail the other day. It says the other one to let you let it vote. I, you know, this is this is outrageous here, folks. You know, these little campaign literature from community, not commodity. Don't y'all guys don't even know me. You know, I worked on this. I got a new paper clipping clip in here from 1987, where we ran a housing bond campaign. We had the support of almost everyone except for the South City, South River City Citizens Neighborhood Association that went out against us, and they defeated that bond election. It was for $22 million. And, and, and ever since, it had been a struggle to get affordable housing here, and now we're getting to that point now where there is no people in my neighborhood. You know, y'all saying y'all want to save the people in East Austin. That's false. That is false information. Y'all guys have never been down there. There is no more folks living down there. Just the ones that are the older homeowners that can afford to stay there because their school taxes are frozen, and the ones that are living in the uh, in subsidy housing that we have created. There's very few people that that can afford that. I always say that the gentrifiers are now getting gentrified. And you're trying to say that we're going to displace people? No, y'all already displaced us. We're just trying to hold on to what we have. And we know only through code next. If I didn't, if we didn't opt in for secondary units, I would have not been able to live there. And the Austin Neighborhood Association were the first. They fought us all the way through to not allow us in my neighborhood to be able to create a short, uh, uh, a secondary unit. And that's the only way that I was able to survive there in, the, in this neighborhood. Right now, the land value is $300,000. $300,000. You're not, you're not, you're not saving us from, from displacement. You already displaced us. You know, we're trying to build more units so that we can bring in more people, more affordable units. And that's what we're doing with Code Next. But, you know, this ain't going to get you nowhere because my people already have done what Code Next is proposing. It's already there. We knew how to survive, and we're going to survive. And and uh, I, I just don't like this little postcard. But y'all more, this is a democracy, and I'm... I, I and I tell people I say yeah they the whole petition is a it's a, a all fake news oh. it's scaring the people in the neighborhood y'all frightening people you know it's sad that y'all have gotten down to that point y'all so low Councilman Garza May. Um, I was waiting to make my comments after the amendments, but I'm, I, I don't know how this is going to go, so I, I'm just going to make some of my uh, comments now. I, I first want to say I don't see this handling of the substitute motion any different than we have ever handled a substitute motion. It's procedural. Um, sure, it's used as a strategy sometimes, but it's I've, I've gotten beat by substitute motions. I've won on substitute motions. It happens all the time to... to to make it sound like this is something different. There have been times when a substitute motion is a yes or no. I, I think this is, a, this is the same situation how substitute motions have always been handled. Um, it's no different. I am very aware and very supportive of the people's power to petition. My involvement in city politics started um, as a young firefighter collecting signatures to try to get collective bargaining on the ballot. Um, I did everything from stand outside, you know, you name it, to get to get signatures, to campaigning to get it passed, to celebrating on election night when we were when firefighters were able to get collective bargaining. Then I was a huge part of 10-1, um, believing strongly that an angry and I remember standing at that podium, mad that the council wouldn't put it on on the on the ballot, and that we had to get. So I too went out and and, and grabbed those signatures and campaigned hard. And we won, and we were the underdog. What's really this level of discourse and this comparing things as if they're apples to apples is really disingenuous. 
There was never any doubt whether 10-1 could be placed on the ballot. There was never any doubt whether collective bargaining could be placed on the ballot. Comparing this to SOS, I appreciate the, the, the mayor's comparison here. This is the, that was a timing issue and an entirely different issue. This is not SOS. Um, I don't believe this is, I don't think it's about Code Next. I don't think it's about whether I believe in democracy or not. It's not about 10-1 for me. Facts matter, laws matter, words matter. I am a lawyer, and I'm grateful every day that I am, especially on days like today. Um, to, to say that our city legal hired the salesman to make this pitch, our city legal has no, has no dog in this fight. And in fact, our city legal often errs on the conservative side time and time again when they give us legal advice. And here, we have been told, we've been shown that this is not a proper thing to put on the ballot. If this was any other subject, I would still be on the side that I am. I have not seen anything that sways me to the other side that this is a proper, um, a proper thing for the ballot. We've been asked not to play judge and jury. I think the substitute motion does exactly that. It says we're not gonna play judge and jury. We're gonna let a judge or jury decide that. Um, and to speak to, you know, this, in so many ways reminds me of, of the Uber fight, of disingenuous things said to get um, a, petition, a petition signature and then attacking and then personally attacking council members um, to try to sway them with disingenuous things. All of you, I know you believe in your heart that this is the right thing. I hope you understand that for those of us who, who are supporting the substitute motion, we believe in our heart that, this, that we're doing the right thing. And I wish we could really change the level of discourse that this Trump presidency has apparently allowed all of us to think is just okay. Any further discussion before we take a vote on the substitute motion? Council Member Poole. Um, I wanted to see, I know Mr. Pantalian started to come up to answer the question about how staff was referring to the repeal and replace with regard to valid petitions. And I wanted to get into the record um, the answer to the question that was, that was asked about what was it that staff was telling the community about whether they would be able to, um, whether they would retain valid petition rights with this comprehensive uh, rewrite of our land development zone. And then while he's coming up to answer that, I would also like somebody to answer the question for me, what percentage of the code next rewrite refers specifically to zoning, which is the piece that has been much um, debated around as the part that cannot be uh, part of uh, a ballot initiative. So first on the valid petitions, uh, thank you, Mr. Pantalian. Yeah. And um, this will be a very brief answer. I'm gonna defer that to the law department. Joe Pantalian, interim assistant city manager. Thank you. So, Mayor, I think that we have provided a memo on this question, but it's a little bit different from what you all are asking now. Um, and, of course, we give our legal, our legal advice to you, um, not in public. So we can provide further answers about that to you at a different time. Okay. And so that, that then will be tabled, that piece there, because the, the point that Councilmember Alter was raising, and which I have also raised previously, is that, on the one hand, the community was told that this rewrite um, obviated their ability to individually bring a valid petition concerning changes in zoning to the property within 200 feet of their dwelling. So that was eliminated from the conversation a good couple of years ago, if I'm remembering right. And now we are being told that, no, this, this, uh, you also can't have a ballot petition because it is zoning and uh, you can't have zoning on, um, on a ballot. So. So there is the dichotomy, and I want to get to the bottom of it because it doesn't seem fair or right uh, to the public to tell them that they don't have access to this decision in either of those instances. Now, I would like to get um, from our staff an answer to the second question that I asked, and that is what percentage, in fact, is the code next rewrite uh, zoning? What percentage? of the code next rewrite is specifically zoning. I guess Mr. Pantalian got the, uh, the black ball on that one too. Yeah, I say something. 
So I'm um, uh, sorry. Let me yeah. just jump in. I'm not sure that we can give you a percentage. There are zoning pieces with that within the whole part of Code Next. I think um, the drafters could be um, more helpful there, but it's not a particular percentage. Well, it it is a if I may, it is a particular percentage. There is a portion of the rewrite that is zoning and there is a portion that is not zoning. Um, and so I think that is also um, a relevant point because of the severability piece that is in the petition that has been offered by the public and which, ha which point has been pressed more than once today and previously that if indeed there are elements of the rewrite that pertain to zoning and which, just for argument's sake, say we agree that they should not be on the ballot, then those would be severed. I don't actually happen to agree that that's the case, but I would like to get a sense of what portion of the rewrite would not be able to be on the ballot. Um, and then the last thing I'd, I'd just like to say, and, and Mayor, this is, this is for you, when you were talking in your exposition a little bit ago about the oath that you took as an elected official, which I, I took it too, as did the others on this dais and others before us, and you said that your oath was that you cannot, you can't do anything illegal, or, or words to that effect. Something that I think is illegal, yes. So I just wanted to ask you, if, if I disagree with your position, are you then are you then saying that should my vote differ from yours that what I am doing is somehow a violation of my oath or or is illegal no i I, I think that that you take this job very seriously and I think that you vote your conscience and I think you vote what you believe the law compels you to to do uh, what I was meaning to say was that that uh, for me, uh, this, uh, based on the, all the law that, that I've seen, it would be illegal. Uh, and, and even though I think it would be easier for me to overlook that and say, well, let's just put this on the ballot, uh, I can't do that for me given, given my interpretations of the law. But I, I think everybody on this dais is trying their, their utmost to do this job to the best of their And I think, I think we all are as well. And I feel, in contrary to, to your position, that not putting this, this vote, this proposition on a ballot is illegal. In the same way that you are defining the illegality for you, that is, that is how I feel about it. Thank you. Um, Councilor Kassar and Councilmember Alder. I think everybody else has had a chance to talk, so I want to share my thoughts on this as well. This is a, a really tough one. And I think, um, as folks just discussed, this really, my vote has nothing to do with my opinions on Code Next or my opinions um, on the uh, petition. Just a short time ago, I think we all unit unanimously voted to put the Uber Lyft uh, ordinance on the ballot, even though in my private capacity, I voted against that and wish they hadn't brought that to us. Um, it, was our legal obligation, regardless of our opinion, to put it on the ballot. There was a, a recall petition that was being circulated against one of our colleagues, and even though I, as, in a, as a private citizen, was adamantly opposed uh, to that petition, if they had <coughs> properly gathered the signatures and turned, us, turned it into us, as a public official, it would have been my job to put it on the ballot, even if in private I would have done everything to keep my colleague uh, on the dais. And so in this case, it has nothing to do with whether I agree or disagree um, with uh, the, the ballot measure as it is posted, it has everything to do with whether or not I believe that I am legally required to put it on the ballot or legally banned from putting it on the ballot. And every single attorney that I've spoken with that is independent, and that has been multiple attorneys uh, that have nothing to do with um, either side on this issue, have stated that it's really clearly I'm really clear that I, as an elected official, am banned from putting this to election. Uh, and my own reading of the law seems to me that I am banned from putting this on uh, to election. But I take people's 
ability to vote on things extremely seriously and wouldn't want to make that decision on my own. And so that's why I appreciate uh, the substitute motion's ability to, to ask a judge to make a determination otherwise if all of these independent attorneys uh, and what seems to me to be a clear reading of the law is wrong. But since I'm, so again, this really shouldn't have anything to do with Code Next being on the ballot or not, being a good idea or not, because it simply is a legal requirement of the council to put things on the ballot if we're legally required to, and to not do so if we're legally prohibited from doing so. And it seems to me that we uh, are legally prohibited from doing so. But um, I anticipate that this will be in court and um, of course would, um, would be happy to put it on if that, um, if a judge determines otherwise. Councilmember Alter. Um, I wanted to ask Ms. Morgan if she could explain to me how this would pr proceed and particularly I'm wondering if the language that's contained in the substitute motion from my colleagues, if that were adopted and the city were sued, what action would our legal staff take? Well, if the city is sued, the, we will defend the city's action. So we would march forward, file an answer, and, and the legal question would be teed up, and a judge would hear it. But I'm confused as to what our action is if what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that they're saying that they want this to be interpreted by the court. It's not to argue against it in the court. It's to get the court to rule it. But if the city goes in and argues against it, that's not letting the court rule. That's the city making a ruling. So I'm trying to understand what the direction that's provided to staff in this case should this go to court. And I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, I'm, I, I hear other things where it's always the city's supposed to defend our position, but I don't understand what our position would be vis-a-vis -vis this issue if what we really want is a ruling from the court as to whether it's valid or not. We don't need to make an argument one way or another. We need to just let the court rule. And, and I may be confused, but I, 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 I understand that in other cases we have to um, move forward as a city in responding and we support the city's case, but I don't know what the city's position is on this if we just want a ruling. Could, could I speak to that, Mr. Mayor? I asked Ms. Morgan. I would like to hear I, from I think her you're first. putting her on the spot because she's not the person to answer this question. We are. She runs the city legal department. Not on her own. She runs the, the city legal department on our direction. Do you want to, do you want to clarify? Do you want to clarify your intent? Okay. My uh, uh, all I'm saying is, and I, I don't mean to interfere with you asking the city man, the city legal a question. I'm just saying that I think that it's not a fair question to our legal department because, as you know, we talk all the time in executive session and publicly with our legal department on what kind of position we want to take as a council. So I think to I think the question for the city city attorney is what she would do absent anything else in terms of direction from the council as a whole. So I, I what we will do is I assume that um, if the substitute motion were to pass then people might follow a lawsuit and we would be in a position of defending it and the court would make a decision. I think that's what you're asking is for the court to make a decision. But is it the intention then of the substitute motion makers to have the city defend it and say that they don't have a right or is it the intention to find out whether or not it's valid to put the petition up? I, I mean, you're going to ask me to vote on this in a minute and I don't understand what I'm voting on if I don't understand what, the, what that intention is. I think that a majority of the council, six people, have indicated that they don't believe that the law allows this to be put on the ballot. If a court rules otherwise, then, then we're taking the action to, to put it on the ballot and we're doing everything we can to make the case as ripe as we can uh, right now to be able to do that. And I would expect the city attorney to, to defend that um, consistent with whatever other instructions they got in executive session. Any Mayor. further discussion before we take a vote? Mayor, yes, on, along those lines then, um, I would like to offer an amendment <coughs> to the um, what appears to be the, what, what is your substitute motion then that we um, memorialize uh, that the city take no position on validity, that we simply offer up the facts of the case and allow a judge to make that determination without arguing 
one side or the other, for that matter. I'd like to make that amendment. Okay. Um, would you would you view that as um, as friendly, in the spirit of the uh, substitute motion that you have um, put together, where you are saying that you don't really want to be the determiner of this question. You would like a judge to make that ruling, to have the judge be the final arbiter and mediator, which to me means that we would not come in since the diocese is split, um, that, we would, that the city would then not offer up a defense or, uh, or um, support for either side of the question. I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that and I wouldn't support it because I think for me it would be disingenuous. I can't uh, hear you. I wouldn't accept that, and, and I wouldn't vote for it, uh, because I think it would be disingenuous. Uh, I think that, that each of us on here need to, to take the, the legal advice we get. We need to read the, the, the case law and then see the work we've done, and then we need to, to act in accordance with that. Uh, if, a, if a court rules otherwise, then, then we have a provision that, that deals with that. But for me, um, I think that part of my job is to, as I see it, is to, to, to act consistent with how I think the law requires. Well, then I have a follow-up question then for our city attorney as far as process. When you do go, so let's say this is um, a court filing, and you do, as a city, go in to um, state the city's case, will you be providing the judge with a full and complete record of the various positions that have been taken by the various council members, both pro and con, so that the judge will have the full array of the, um, of the continuum of support or of, of the continuum of opinion on, on these issues? And, in other words, are the things that I'm saying on the record here today also going to be of value in the courtroom, and will the judge have access to that, and will the city provide those comments that have been made by those who, who are in opposition to what the mayor is talking about? Councilman Poole and the rest of you, I'm not sure exactly what will happen in the courtroom and what case will be brought against the city, but this is really a question of law, so the judge will not be um, hearing everything in the world, but we'll be focused on what the law is. And of course, your comments here are public record. I would just like to make some kind of em emphasis, put some emphasis around that, that those of us who have, sp have spoken in opposition, that the essence of the points that we are making and the community as well should also be part of that record. Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor, um, since we're using the process you laid out, I would like to move uh, an amendment to the substitute motion, and that would be to remove the not in the first be it resolved clause. Okay. There's a motion to remove the not in the first be it resolved clause. Is there a second to that? Mm -hmm. It's used in seconds, that. And so just for those who may not have the copy in front, that would make it the city council hereby determines to place the aforementioned petition sponsored ordinance on the November 6th, 2018 ballot. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Are we ready to take a vote? Those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Ms. Houston, Councilmember Poole, author, and the Mayor Pro Tem. Those opposed? Balance of the dais. Ms. Troxclair off. The amendment's defeated. Before us now is the motion to consider the substitute instead of Ms. Houston's motion. Those in favor considering Thank the you, substitute? Mayor. I, I wanted to ask a question about the city manager. If I might. Okay. Um, we mentioned earlier the issue about the valid petition rights, and we are getting lots of requests from constituents. Um, and I understand you may have provided us something in um, confidential memos, but um, the community needs to know whether they have valid petition rights or not. And so I would ask that we find a way to provide some communication about that. Um, to the community. If they are not going to have valid petition rights, then we need to have some clarity on that. And we, as council members, need to be able to communicate to our constituents what the ruling is on that. Okay. So, Councilmember, I'll consult with legal and get back to you on that. 
They take a vote. Those, and, Ms. Houston? And, and Mayor, I, I just want to say that I'm going to take be voting against your substitute, and I'm going to be doing it with integrity and honor, because unlike some comments today, um, I do believe that voters have a right to petition, referendum, and a vote on things that will negatively impact every parcel of land in this city. Not only the property, but other things that have nothing to do with zoning. And to deny them that right, to me, is a travesty. And so I just thank you for all the work that you've done trying to come up with something, but I'll be voting against your substitute. I understand. Ms. Kitchen? I, I said most of what I wanted to say earlier, but I just want to reiterate I'll be voting for the substitute. And I, do, I also believe that the public has the right to vote where it's legal. And I also just want to reemphasize that if I could split this, and put, what, put on the ballot what was legal, I would. But the charter very clearly says that our only option is to submit said, and I'm quoting from the charter, submit said initiated ordinance without amendment. So I think trying to, to do something that's clearly counter to the charter would not be appropriate either. So I'm gonna vote for the substitute again because I said before, I think that's the best, clearest route within the law that we can honor the, re the request from the, from the public. Just to address the severability argument real earlier, because I didn't make that part of my arguments that came up, a severability clause in the proposed ordinance itself just means that if that ordinance was in effect, a court in determining the legality of the ordinance could strike the parts that were not proper and keep the parts that were. But that sever severability clause in the ordinance that goes to its enforcement and its application is not the question in front of us. And that severability clause has nothing to do with whether or not we can divide something from that came to us from a petition before we put it on the ballot. Ms. Houston. I promise this is the, the last thing. Um, the right to vote is something that members of my community hold dear. Um, and we have been in situations, I have personally been in situations where the law has disenfranchised me from that right. Um, and uh, I'd never want to be put in a position where I am in that same kind of uh, position where legally it may be the right thing to do, but morally it's absolutely the wrong thing to do. And <clears throat> I believe that you're, with your whole heart, you believe the, 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 the truth of what you said. I've also spent a lifetime uh, helping to ensure the, the right to be able to, to vote. Uh, and my assessment of, of this situation is, is different than yours. Those in favor of considering a substitute instead of the main motion, please raise your hand. Uh, Flanagan, Kassar, uh, Renteria, Garza, Kitchen, and me, that's six. Those opposed? So you have the four on the dais with trucks clear off. We're going to consider the substitute. Let's now consider the substitute. Those in favor of the substitute, please raise your hand. Those opposed to the substitute, please raise your hand. It's the same vote as the last one. Uh, the substitute is passed. Thank you. And I also want to thank the council on the dais. This was a really hard vote. This was a hard discussion. Uh, and I think that we, we, we did this one well. And with the allowance that, that we were going to give room for everybody on the dais to, to, to be able to, to express and support uh, their, their conscience. So I appreciate that for my colleagues. All right, let's do uh, uh, the next item we're going to do at 4 o'clock here. We're going to do the public hearings that we can knock off real quickly. Uh, and then we're going to do uh, uh, the consent agenda on planning commission so we can get done with that. And then we're going to do Waller Creek. So.